David Essa. Hey, Dom. How you doing? Ah, decent. <laughs> do, do you want me to just not ask you that question? I, I hate fake answering this question. Okay. And I rarely have a podcast-friendly answer. <laughs> okay. Hey, Dom. Hey, Vanessa. Uh, <laughs> it's hard, see? Yeah. What do you do now? Well, welcome to Uncertain Things. Welcome to Uncertain Things, the podcast. The podcast for the melancholy and somber. Mm-hmm. Brooding hum. Well, today we are thrilled to have Nicholas Christakis. Yale professor of evolutionary biology who wrote Blueprint, The Evolutionary Origins of a Good Society, and more recently, Apollo's Arrow, The Profound and Enduring Impact of Coronavirus on the Way We Live. We spent a good two hours talking and meandering about a whole weird eclectic mixtape worth of topics from the asymmetrical relationship between celebrities and their fans, the way that coronavirus exposed the fragility of of our institutions and specifically of the scientific citadel and you know being uncertain things this led us to discuss the broader crisis in truth seeking and truth disseminating systems in our deeply cherished liberal world something that we certainly and i I believe most of our audience care deeply about i also couldn't resist talking about the infamous youtube video of of Christakis from almost six years to the day when he was standing in the quad making the case for not just the right of students and professors to hold bad or unloved opinions, but also if you go back and watch it, you'll see him actually making the case for Blueprint, his his book, in so many words. The idea that humans share certain core ideas about what makes a good or just community. So it's that idea that we ended up spending most of the time discussing, and specifically the idea that he propounds in Blueprint about the social suite. Right, the social suite. From from my understanding, it's it's like the the almost universal characteristics that humans have developed by dint of evolution it's like because of the way we have evolved we have evolved to for example love our significant other we have evolved to have friends um and he kind of distills the 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 uh, what is it like eight or so that are bedrock foundations of of humankind and heritable characteristics across the the spectrum of humanity which is something that sociologists and anthropologists sometimes don't love to consider. And it's something that we like we we really stress tested with him because this idea of trying to find universals is just kind of an unpopular thing to do in 2021. Why you want why you got a lump instead of split. Yeah, and you know, actually I don't want to drag this opening any longer because this is one of our longer conversations already, but I should pin a note that that in reading Christakis, which I recommend to everyone, I really related to this desire to find universals. But in one of my fields of study, which is linguistics, I was actually trained in the school of rabid splitters, hated lumpers. If you've listened to our talk with Adam Neely, I, I went on a bit of a, a tangent about my relationship to Noam Chomsky's scholarship in linguistics. So it's funny finding myself on the other camp. Um, one technical point to note before we actually start uh we had a, a bit of a side side tangent within a tangent conversation oh yes about um christakis's idea of the exophenotype which is his version of the idea that richard dawkins proposes of the extended phenotype it's a little topic in evolutionary biology that fascinates me and about which I understand very little. So it would be irresponsible for me to not exploit the chance of having him on a Zoom call to ask him about it. But it really came out of nowhere at the end. So rather than trying to artificially insert it into the edit, I'm just going to leave it in the post credits. There's a bonus for anybody who wants to listen. I usually use it to drop some outtakes and Easter eggs. This time you're going to get a 12 minute worth of Easter egg. If we were more responsible and mercenary, we would have probably put it beyond behind up a, a paywall in our patreon or something but we are we are not yet that but if you do want to support our patreon it exists um on certain things and soon so will our Substack uh, um support system if you want to show pecuniary love uh but if you want to show non-pecuniary love you can also just share us with friends because that's actually the best way 
to show love to us and to your friends. Um, and, uh, yeah, and give us five stars on Apple podcast because that really helps us. And if you're a listener that makes it all the way to the end of the extended phenotypes, you should definitely let us know. Send us a tweet. Send us your hashtag exophenotype <laughs> tweets. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, <laughs> Nicholas Christophe. I see, I see you guys are all distributed at home too. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, it's interesting because I come across to many people as very extroverted and mm -hmm. I'm, I, I don't mind being in a group, although I don't particularly like groups. Uh, I, I, I can be sociable, I can engage with groups of people, uh, et cetera. But actually, I'm maybe not so secretly just deeply introverted. Like the only thing I want to do is sit in my office and write or, <laughs> or think or look at statistical output. And yeah. so the pandemic has been a godsend. Oh. Uh, <laughs> because I, you know, I just. You're in your here. element. Yes. Yes. It's, you know, and I, I'm not going to say I'm going to miss the pandemic when it's over and it's not over yet. But, um, but I, um, but certainly there've been some unexpected benefits. Let's just say that. For sure. Is that, I, I'm sure there's also like a large correlation with being a career academic and being an introvert, isn't there? Or there, I mean, there has to be in order to, to actually do the work. Yes and no. I mean, the, the, certainly the stereotype and my impression is that, uh, you know, academics are kind of antisocial nerds, you know, they get very obsessed with small things. They, they're socially awkward, et cetera, et cetera. And I mean, I think, Certainly, in many cases, that's true. I mean, I, I think academics are less socially gifted than politicians or than, uh, but you know, it also reminds me a little bit of those movie stars that you read their profiles occasionally and they're, they hate it. You know, they find it really stressful to like constantly be on display and, you know, and out there. And I'm thinking, well, why the hell did you become a movie star? I mean, you know, like, how it's incompatible with your profession, you know? I mean, it's like, Oh. And and it's true because you also see a lot of those people who, when they're on stage, they they can explode, and then you meet them in person, and they are those nebulous right. creatures. Well, to be fair, the vast majority of actors are not movie stars, so the vast majority are probably just living for the art, not recognized. Uh, it's only a very small echelon. <laughs> well, for a part of that as well is that if you're again, you're right. Uh, Vanessa's right. We should draw a distinction between. Right. Celebrities who can be recognized on the street and just uh, you know, working <laughs> actors. Uh, right. But um, even for the celebrities, part of it is they get annoyed, you know, be constantly recognized after a while. You know, it's like, Jesus, I just like to go to the grocery store and not have to not have to. You know, it's, I once I once remember I went to a I, I had some testimony in the United States in a committee of the United States Senate a long time ago. I was a young I was 40 or something. And uh I went to the Capitol and I walked into the building and then I went to the hearing room. And then all of a sudden there was like Bob Dole and like uh, Ron Wyden and all these United States senators who, of course, I had seen on the news since I was a young person. It felt like I knew who they were and I felt like I knew their character. And, 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 uh, and of course, they had no idea who I was, right. you know, like I wanted to go and say, hi, Bob, how are you? You know? And I mean, it must be both both flattering to people like that, but also irritating, right? Like, you know, I don't know who you are. How dare you, you know, address me like we're old friends? Yeah, and this is something that messes up with your ability to read and react to social situations, right? This, is, this goes against our fundamental codes. When you see somebody in the street and their face is just lighting up um, at seeing you and you have right. zero yes. connection to them, it must fuck I you up. Yes, I have this yes. on a very, very teeny, minuscule level. I do not want to compare myself to a celebrity in any way, shape, or form. But I make a podcast for my company, and so I meet people at my company yes. who have never, um, who have never met me, but who know me because they've listened to every episode. And so that we often will begin a conversation like, "Oh, I know you. You're Vanessa." Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> and it's fine. It doesn't. It doesn't ruin it. It's. A, it's actually kind of nice. It kind of like brings a level of energy to the to the to the to the meeting, which is kind of fun for me, anyway. Someone disorienting it's clearly something that we're not we're, we're still still figuring out how to handle yeah and i think now that you think about it i think these types of social interactions i'm sure scholars have written about this i'm just not familiar with this there's a kind of possibility of asymmetric social interaction that is abetted by modern technology right like right. media that allow us to 
allow a situation in which one person is known by so very many right. and, and, and where those so many, very many people feel they have an intimate relationship with that person. And that is so asymmetric. Of course, there were kings in ancient days, although even in ancient days, they would have to, you might not recognize the king, right? This is why the right. king traveled with certain insignia to say, this is the king, right? There were no photographs right. or other media to say, you know, so you'd say, oh my God, this is so-and-so. And whereas now, Oh, I recognize him from the back of the coin. Yes. Yes. But even that, you know, it's not such an accurate rendition. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> so, uh, not, not quite. Not quite. So, but it's interesting because, so it's a both, a, 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 you know, there, a, there's this sort of asymmetric kind of social relationship as possible. It reminds me a little bit of, um, of, uh, like, um, like, like soap operas, you know, like where, where the people watching the soap opera, really come to be invested in what's happening in the soap opera and really feel like these people are, I mean, they, they don't, I mean, they know they're fictional, but they, they really somehow get tricked. You know, it's a bit like, I, I think that's why media like Instagram, you know, these, these technologies are built to exploit ancient proclivities. We, we hmm. evolved to be deeply interested in the lives of other people. And we evolved to be very attentive to gossip. And I think soap operas and Instagram are, um, and so on, and other forces of media actually exploit these ancient proclivities. They give little dopamine hits when we are, you know, peering into the lives of others or learning information about the lives of others that, you know, might potentially have survival utility later on. But it's all a fiction. Mm. You know, it's like, it's not real, you know. Anyway. But that hence more compelling. The fiction is what is what exactly makes you keep going. Because if it were real, then you'd probably drop off it's like in christopher nolan's the prestige there is this theme that a magic act can be too convincing or it will scare people off maybe i don't know i mean look yes perhaps in the case of the soap operas but if you think about some of these social media technologies they're in a kind of hybrid state i mean you know that the when you log on to one of these social media and you see typically the best lives of many other people it's real but fake you know it's both uh, and, um, and part of it is, I've talked to some young people about this, you know, if you, if you're connected to a thousand other people every single day, there's at least one person who is having a vastly better day than you, hmm. who's won a prize, who's in scuba diving in the Maldives, who's, you know, God knows what they're doing, but everything. So if you're comparing your current day with the best day of one out of a thousand people every single day, you will always be miserable, right? Your, your every day will always be a lousy day compared to the best day of one out of a thousand people every single day. Yeah. And that's without even bringing to uh, consideration the fact that these systems incentivize you professionally to curate the best days yes. daily, even even while you're miserable. You yes. need to show <laughs> yourself right. gallivanting. And to lie. I mean, even leave you lie. Exactly. Also. Exactly. <laughs> No, no, that, that, that's what I mean. Exactly. You, you're talk, talk about acting. It's, you're, you're creating a whole show of, of, of pleasure, joy, opulence, and thriving that is just has not commensurate with your mental or for sometimes your financial state at all. Yes. It's, yeah. well, this is one of the things, this is one of the things I talk about, and maybe you'll use part of this conversation in your podcast. I don't know. I mean, we're having a meandering I, conversation, but. Uh, I mean, our podcast is meant for meandering, meandering conversations. conversations. Yes. <laughs> no, so one of the things that, this is one of the things that I contrast, you, you're probably both surely aware. I mean, there's some scientific debate about exactly how to measure economic inequality and how these measures might change across time and may or may not mm -hmm. capture the actual reality of the situation. But for the sake of argument, the formal measured economic inequality in our society right now is at like a hundred year high. We're like at the time, at the age of the robber barons, you know, so it's any argue, and I, I believe this, it, it's just an unsustainably high level of economic inequality. And the pandemic, of course, struck, well, we already had these baseline, this baseline dynamic that as a society, we were going to have to uh, address. But one of the differences, socially speaking, in my view, between the level of economic inequality we have now, like the Gini coefficient is like, you know, I don't know what it is, 0.4 or something. I mean, it's really high and almost as high as it was it higher than it was in you know during the during the um, the, the the roaring 20s one of the differences was that those guys the carnegies and the mellons and the rockefellers you know those people were so wealthy they laid private railroad tracks like the mm -hmm. private jets of 100 years ago across multiple states they would have like a rail line uh laid for their own personal use and then they would have 
you know, specialized rail cars that would transport them, for example. Or I read the story of one very wealthy woman in New York in the 1910s um, had air conditioning in her house. Before anyone else, she contrived to have a private rail car that delivered coal underground to her basement and combusted <laughs> the coal to, uh, to drive compressors, which cooled the air in her Manhattan townhouse. I mean, the level of opulence required for these things and wealth was just extraordinary. So there were people who lived like that, of course, but let alone all the other fancy stuff. But my point is, we didn't know about it. They, those people mm -hmm. lived behind hedges and the media were owned by them or didn't report on them. So right now, on the other hand, the, the inequality is more manifest. The person on the street is aware of how uh, much wealthier people live, what the li lifestyles of the rich and famous, you know, what is the lifestyle of these individuals. We have drones that can fly over their properties. We have photography. We have public record uh, keeping that you know reports. We have the Forbes 100 list that replies us. We have we have uh, reality television shows that go yes, in their homes. <laughs> all of these things exactly. So I, and I think this cannot but but to, um, but increase resentment. But something changed because in the 80s to 90s, the media was still obsessed with opulence. It put it right in front of you. I, I name checked Robin Leach the other day and there was blank stares around me. Apparently Robin Leach has, is, is not staying sticking with the younger generation, but Robin Leach Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. Do you remember that, Adam? Yes. Mm -hmm. No, also yeah. blank stare. It was like MTV Cribs before MTV Cribs. It was a British guy. Well, and it exactly serves my point. <laughs> the thing is that people really want to see that. And, and there was, seems to be a lot of like the people took pleasure in this fantasy and, and like partly entertaining the possibility of maybe reaching there themselves. Something changes now that, that this is creating more resentment than it does uh, a sense of pleasure or potential or, or a dream, even though the material conditions of most people haven't declined in, in proportion to how much resentment has accrued, I think. It, so something, yeah. something changed, no? It's got to be, and I, I want to hear what um, Nicholas has to say about this, but I think it's got to be something about American culture too, right? Because I'm thinking like when my dad's Irish, he, he used to say like the difference between America and the US is that, you know, you look at someone with a lot of money and you say, oh, I want to be them. And in Ireland, you'd say, oh, you look at someone with a lot of money and you want to like, let's, how do we tear them down? <laughs> And I think that that has that seems to be shifting in the U.S. doesn't seem to be as as integral to our culture anymore. All of these observations, I think, have some truth and validity to them. I don't know. I, I, I can't I can't rightly say exactly to what extent each of them applies. But I do agree. First of all, I don't think uh, just on the, on the on both, uh, just to pick up one thread from what each of you said. What Adam said, one of the reasons. Americans have historically been so willing and able to tolerate this level of inequality has been the belief, if not the partial reality, of class mobility. So the reason the poor are willing to tolerate the, the rich is because they believe that one day I might be rich too. So I don't want, you know, and, and there is a possibility of class mobility in our society declining in the last few years, but historically has always been that far exceeds what other societies allow. You know, so you have all these billionaires, many of them, you know, started life with quite humble means, for example. And those are stories in the media that people can understand and relate to. Hmm, so wait, wait, so are you thinking that we lost our uh, potential for mobility? No, it's not that we've lost our potential for mobility, although there is some decline. There's, I've seen some evidence of this. It's that I'm not sure you're right that... Um, it, it's, this is a very complicated area, complicated area. So on the one hand, uh, the median American household has not, uh, 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 incomes have not risen in, in, after accounting for inflation for the median mm -hmm. American household in like 20 or 30 years. So people, the, the, all the rise in wealth in society have primarily gone to the top 1% of the society. Uh, and that's partly a reflection of what we were talking about earlier about the uh, economic inequality. So, and I think that is one of the things that's also manifesting itself in our politics. You know, there's this kind of disgruntlement, you know, like, for example, a, a, a kind of um, upper working class wage, you know, from 30 years ago was enough to support your family. Now it's not. You need two jobs or both people need to work and so on. Uh, same actually with middle class households. You know, they feel further and further uh, falling behind. You know, people, you know, we, we pay our congressman, I forgot what we pay him, a couple hundred grand or 
I don't know what it is right now, but it's it's really not it, it, to the to the, the median out income from a household of four in our country is still like sixty grand or something like that. Mm-hmm. So we pay our congressmen two or three times that, which probably seems a lot to their constituents, but actually it's not a lot of money uh, for, in general, for an important job, uh, let alone for many of those people who could have earned money, you know, doing other things. So, 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 so the median household income hasn't really gone up by, by many measures. On the other hand, by other measures, uh, it has, because the, these, these economic accounts do not, for example, take into account the existence of, a tel- of an iPhone or a telephone. In other words, lowering costs. Yes. So the so the so the so the quality of life you see has gone up. Of course, like a person at the median today is is living a better life than the person at the median thirty years ago, and by many accounts. So these are complicated topics. Yeah, but yeah. I think no one would no one would argue. I don't think that. Uh, well, actually, some people do argue that they they say that after you account for for government transfers, uh, income inequality has not gone up, which is a really Another complicated and somewhat odd claim, right. but most people yeah. would agree that uh, you know we have higher levels of inequality uh, than we used to have. Right, right. I, I'll, I'll just throw throw it in, and then we'll jump to your uh, to your first book that we're going to discuss. I, I have a segue in mind, Dom. Just FYI, the, the question is always like: to what extent inequality is a useful parameter in itself, barring for just the the the, the social impact of resentment, because it. If the rising quality level or if, if the, qual- the life quality balances out in a way that a majority of people feel secure generally, and then the inequality in itself doesn't really matter aside for the invidiousness it engenders, does it? Yeah, I mean, I think if I've understood your question, that's the classic comparison on absolute versus relative standing. Mm-hmm. So, and, and, and this can be illustrated by anecdotes such as the following, you know, would you rather be a poor person in the United States is... Uh, economically may be vastly better off than um, than a rich person in many very poor countries or a rich person let's say in a, in a little village in Latin America or even a rich American 40 50 years ago yes or the famous example is you know you and I are leading lives that far surpass the luxury of uh, of Julius Caesar you know uh, you know we have we can heat our water with the touch of a button we have rapid communications with anyone we want in the world we have all the information we want. We have a level of security that doesn't require Praetorian Guard. You know, we we have all there's, of these, you know. Right. Even more even more recently, we far surpassed the lives of British lords during the height of colonial Britain. Yes, exactly. So that's like, you know, so absolutely speaking, we are better off than those people. But relatively speaking. Psychologically yes, speaking, that's the that's the I might there. still rather prefer to be Julius Caesar. <laughs> than, than to be Nicholas Christakis, you know. Um, uh, on the other hand, uh, yeah, well, anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Modessa, take us to Blueprint. I'll attempt to, but then I'll, I'll, I'll hand it over to you, Dom. But yeah, I think, I mean, one of the themes that I think is going to come up across a, a lot in this conversation, which is one we're already talking about, is this, is the perception of division instead of the search for commonality. Um, and I think we're already talking about this, like people are dwelling in the inequities, the differences. Um, and so, and so I think this is like a theme mm. that comes up in a lot of your books. And I think we can, we can definitely dive into blueprint because I think Adam and I are very curious about this, this project that you took, took on to, to try and find these universalities at a time when people are not terribly interested in right. universalities, or it feels like an old fashioned kind of thing to do in a way. We'll, we'll try to wait our way. And if you need to call us idiots for our questions, please do. Um, so this goal of finding universals in, in human behavior, something that has been considered anathema by many scholars in, in philosophy and the social sciences. Um, we were more interested in seeing the, the concrete differences and sometimes the irreducible differences of groups rather than studying the underlying commonalities. So what drove you in the opposite direction? Well, first of all, there's a ton to say in response to that. I mean, at least I'm going to forget probably some of these points, but at least uh, several ideas come to mind. First of all, for too long, in my view, uh, scientists and people on the street have been focused on the terrible aspects of our evolutionary heritage, you know, on our impulses for selfishness or or mm-hmm. prejudice or hatred or cruelty or violence. And, 
And these defects in human beings and in human societies are obvious. I mean, um, every century is replete with horrors, right? We have pogroms and the Inquisition and slavery and warfare and torture and, and uh, you know, fascism and misinformation. And, you know, it just goes on and on and on. All the awful things that we humans have done to each other forever. It's true. But equally, it's true that we are capable of tremendous goodness. We are capable of love and friendship and cooperation and teaching and all these other wonderful qualities that we actually evolved to manifest. And so part of me was very concerned that we did not have an adequate attention to or account of these wonderful qualities. And I would even argue that these wonderful qualities are, are a better reflection of our true nature. Look, if, if every time I came near you, you lied to me, you, you filled me with falsity about the world around me, or you were cruel to me, or you took my stuff, or you killed me, I would be better off living apart from you, right? I would be better off living alone. And, but that's not how we live. We do not live alone. We live socially. And so the benefits of a connected life must necessarily have outweighed the costs. And so what are those benefits? How can we attend to those benefits? And that's in an, in, in part of what the project Blueprint was all about, was to, was to outline the benefits of social life and provide an evolutionary account for their origin, love, friendship, cooperation, teaching, and so on. First point. Second point, there's this, related to this, is this um, desire not only to to highlight divisions between groups, but also to use evolutionary biology and genetics to highlight the differences between groups. And this also goes back a long time, but that's not what's interesting to me. I'm not interested in using our exploring genetic differences between groups. I'm, I'm interested in understanding the genetic similarity between groups. Virtually all human beings are you know, 99.6% identical genetically. And, and this can provide an account for, for a variety of universal qualities, like these qualities that I've just mentioned, uh, that, that natural selection has endowed us with. Um, and, and I think this is also familiar to any person, any person that's traveled. You go to another part of the world, and maybe initially you're struck by how different things are here. The, the odors, are, the, the food smells different, the people smell different, the the religion is different. The language is different. The, how they go about their work is different. The fabrics are different. Let me photograph this, you know, this thing or that thing. It's all so different. But if you spend some time in that part of the world and talk to people, you very quickly usually realize that how similar they are. They tell jokes. They enjoy the company of their family. They uh, they have schools for their children. You know, they work together and to organize themselves. Um, they engage in all kinds of uh, wonderful um, um, phenomena that make social life possible. And you can then, and it's recognizing that sameness you see that is so interesting to me. And, and so that's another aspect to your, uh, to your question, which is, um, which is ways in which these ideas, uh, for example, about evolutionary and, and biology and genetics need not be seen um, mm. as a threatening to any kind of, you know, people always say, oh, what about eugenics? Well, no, that's not what I'm talking about. It's got nothing to do with that, right? We're talking about something else. First, second point. Third point, actually two more points. Related to the third point is, um, is that there is right now a moment in the United States in particular, and perhaps around the world, where there's a lot of political hay to be made from highlighting differences between groups. Um, the rural versus the urban, the rich versus the poor, black versus white, you know, immigrant versus non-immigrant, generational differences, you know, you know boomers versus Gen Z, you know, and uh, uh, all of these differences. But, but I, I, quite apart from the fact that I think that's politically ill-advised and dangerous, and quite apart from the fact that I think that it is... Um, you know, it's philosophically not in keeping with the kind of society I want to live in. I don't want to live in a society that emphasizes the differences between people. Mm. I also think it is it is not an accurate reflection of who we are, uh, that, you know, we are all human beings. We're all soft on the outside. We have a kind of common humanity 
that both science and philosophy reify and um, or should reify. And and that is, you know, part of what I I try to do uh, in Blueprint. So um, so you're right, Adam, to say that, you know, the, the book tries to act as a bit of a gentle corrective to this this ascendant emphasis on difference, which I think is is wrong scientifically and ill-advised politically and um, and 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 bankrupt philosophically, uh, in my mm-hmm. view. So, um, so I think that, um, so that's like, I think the third point I would make in that regard, and actually I'll make a sub point to that and then I'll make a fourth point and then I'll shut up. Uh, <laughs> the, 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 the side point to that is if you look, think about the current political moment in our society and you think about this emphasis on difference, all these divisions among us and, and all these actors who are highlighting both on the left and on the right, who are highlighting divisions in our society for their own political power. I would say there are two ways out of that. One way out of that, so we have, we imagine you have a population of a thousand people, and uh, and it's been divided into groups, and these groups are at each other's throats. One way out of that is to go up a level, right? Uh, and 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 to say, well, we're all Americans, and so all these divisions you see are less important if we're all members of the same group. And uh, we we evolved to have actually this capacity uh, to do such a thing. For example, when uh, I did review in the book some famous examples of groups that are in conflict, and then when they have a common enemy, suddenly they unite. And I mean, this is the trope in science fiction movies. You know, human beings are fighting with each other, then the aliens invade, and then oh, we all come together to like fight the aliens. And uh, and and so one solution to intergroup conflict is to go up a level to recognize what we all have in common. And, um, and, and, and part of, and, 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 and to some extent, some believe, and I think there's some truth to this, that part of the reason we're having so many divisions and problems in the United States right now, why we're at each other's throats, is an aftershock of the demise of the Soviet Union, you know, that we used to have a common enemy in the Russians. And now with the fall of the Soviet Union, we don't. And so it's easier to fight among ourselves when uh, we, we're not faring, you know, facing, let's say, some shared enemy. To be very clear, I have nothing against the Russians. I love Russian literature and Russian, Russian society. I don't like some aspects of Russian politics, and I certainly don't like what the Russians have been doing in our society lately, but, you know, interfering in our elections and everything else. But, um, but anyway, the point was, so, so one solution to group-level conflict is to go up a level. But, and, and this is, you know, this, is, this was sort of captured by by Alexander de Tocqueville's description, you know, that anyone can be an American. We're all Americans, that you just have to buy into a certain set of fund- the Bill of Rights. You know, you, you accept the Bill of Rights, anyone can be an American. And, it, and, any, and we're a nation of immigrants. Like we have all these wonderful qualities in our society whose purpose is to take an ax to these types of divisions, to reduce tribalism, to, to, to mer- bond us together, pluribus unum and so on. So we you have buy into the rule book and you can play the game. Yes, go up a level. But there's another solution to tribalism and this intergroup conflict, and that's to go down a level. And I discussed that a little bit in Blueprint, because one of the ironies about living socially as we do and as other mammals do, one of the ironies is, is that we also had to evolve the capacity to be distinctive individuals. In other words, to live socially, we must be individuals. Why? Well, we, we, in our species, we communicate our individuality with our faces. I don't know if you've ever given any thought to this. Why do all of our faces look different? You know, all our kidneys work the same. For your kidney to do its job and my kidney to do its job, it has to work the same. But for my face to do its job, it has to be different than your face. Each of our faces look different. Not, and, and this is an evolutionary luxury that we evolved the capacity to signal our identity using our faces and that they're all different. There's a lot of uh, genetic machinery that is required to make our faces look different. And furthermore, there's a lot of genetic genetic machinery that is required to give us brains that are capable of distinguishing faces. You can look at a sea of faces and you can see, ah, these thousand people, every one of them is different to recognize that difference. Now, the reason we evolved to have these capacities to signal and detect individual identity is in the service of living socially. If you you don't want to forget who you've had sex with 
or who you owe a favor to, or who your child is, that you want to care for this child and not someone else's child. You need a way to signal and detect, hi, I am your offspring, you know, care for me. So the capacity for individual identity is, uh, you know, evolved with the capacity to live socially. So we have this capacity to be distinctive individuals, to, to revere distinctive individuals. Incidentally, this is also connected to grief. Why do we grieve when people die? Grief is not sadness. It's not depression. Grief is a very distinctive emotion, which I used to be a hospice doctor. I took care of people who were dying. So I frequently was exposed to and thought about grief. And also in my personal life, I've had grief. Very distinctive emotion. One of the reasons grief is so distinctive is that it's connected to the death of a particular person, right? You don't grieve when people you don't know die. You grieve when some specific person that you know die. You might be sad at the deaths of unknown people, but it's not grief, okay? So we have all this capacity for individual identity, and this is also a way out of tribalism. In other words, instead of going up a level to we're all Americans, you can go down a level to we're all individuals. And this is part of our political history too. If you think about Martin Luther King, what King argues, because he looks forward to living in a time when people are judged by the content of their character rather than the color of their skin, can be seen as individuals. So, so the way to address your question about our current predicament of this tribalism in the United States right now, in my view, evolutionary biology, our evolution has endowed us with tools to escape this problem, it, to go up a level or to go down a level. That's my But it seems to me, when these are the two options, the tension, and, and this is a side point, but where I guess we're immersing ourselves in side points, the, the current tension in the US is, at least in some part, driven by the question, whether we go up or down a level. No, but I don't see those as, we can do both. You see, this is the thing. What we don't want to do is stay in the middle. <laughs> You know, we, that's what we want to avoid. You know, we can, we can, we can all buy, be a part of the American project and also recognize our individuality. I don't think that's the tension. I think the tension right now is at that middle level where a lot of people get a lot of benefit from, from, uh, from privileging tribalism. There are lots of people in who's, who's, who, in, who see it as in their interest to emphasize difference. Yeah, I, I guess if you go all the way up, to the idea that all, all humanity is, is, is some shared unit of share or shared community, then, then it kind of goes full circle back to individualism because total universality just means a collection of individuals. Part of the criticism from you know, the new nationalists against America's history of hyper-individualism. Y- you've in- imagined a universal group that admits no difference between different nations, between American and Chinese and Middle Eastern and European and whatever. And basically the conservative argument is that you should have commitments to your neighbors that, that are different than the rest of the world. And by reducing everything to uh, an individual level or to an overly universalized group, which effectively is the same thing, you're, you're missing the core connections that allow for purpose and meaning to emerge. And I guess the counter argument, or I'd say the mirror argument of this on the left, is that when you bring everything up to a universality, when humanity is just one big happy family, you are effectively burying insidious cultural differences and disparities and inequalities. Yeah, so there's, there's truth to both of those critiques, of course. But first of all, I would say we've overcorrected and we've lost the understanding and vision of our common humanity. Uh, on the right-wing critique, there's, there's absolutely good criticism of that in the sense that what totalitarian regimes try to do is to eliminate and reduce the connection people feel to the direct social intimates. You're supposed to owe your allegiance to the state or to dear leader, right? And so this is why, you know, in uh, communist China or North Korea, everyone dresses the same. And we're supposed to address each other as comrades. We're all the same. Or the Stasi in East Germany try to make, eliminate friendship because we don't want people, want to be a, you don't want to have intimate friends that you really trust. You're supposed to only trust the state and distrust your friendships. Or even in the kibbutzes, for example, why, why we might have collective child rearing so that we want to break the family unit 
so that you don't feel a special loyalty uh, to the family. It's all discussed in Blueprint. So, yep. so you're absolutely right that um, that you know that, uh, and that's not what I'm advocating for. By saying going up a level, I don't say we should all like you know be like uh, like uh, what's it called. Um, that the dystopian novel, because okay, there's so many dystopian novels. Brave New World? 1984. Harrison Bergeron? Yeah, all of them. And Handmaid's Tale. I, wasn't, <laughs> I was looking for Handmaid's Tale. You know, I, I, you know I, I'm not suggesting that we should all become like that. I'm just saying that part of our identity, the way out politically for our tribalism, is to see ourselves as part of the American project or as we're all Americans. So, yeah, so that's that. And on the far left, this notion that, uh, well... You're just defacing difference in power relations. Look, I'm not effacing difference in power relations. Of course, I understand they're important, but I'm saying uh, an overemphasis on that um, thins out our shared understanding of each other, gives us a kind of bankrupt view of human beings, one that I think is, is, in, is, in, is inexorably negative. You know that says that we always are at each other's throats. I don't. I don't agree with that. I fundamentally reject that notion. I reject the notion that because you look different than me, I cannot understand you, or I can't have common cause with you. That's ridiculous. I first of all, I reject that uh, uh, scientifically. I also reject it philosophically and morally, and I certainly reject it politically. You know that this notion that. Uh, our superficial differences are the most important thing about us is, is wrong, you know? And, and there are these wonderful videos that went viral uh, a few years ago. I mean, unfortunately they were for like beer ads or something for some kind of beer in Europe where, um, where they, they had people that looked superficially very different, you know, black and white and rich and poor. They were like working class guys with tattoos and people in suits and they all came in and they're different gay and straight, you know, in, in a very stereotypic way, you know, they look very gay and they brought all these people into this, this uh, room and they were all looking at each other suspiciously, you know, these cameras, this panopticon cameras, like all these people. And then they said, you know, who was a class clown? And the groups divided, totally ignoring everything else. You know, you had class clowns in every part of the group or, or who was bullied in school and, you know, divided. Who came from a divorced household? Who's lost someone they loved? And then you found this like tattooed, you know, pierced person sitting next to this like prim suit person who were hugging each other because they understood each other's sadness and what it meant to lose a parent when you're a child, right? I mean, it brings you to tears to see this, right? And, and it's this, this is what I think the way we should see each other, at least in my view. And in, in, and although the blueprint was not a work of politics and it, just a little bit of work of philosophy. It's primarily work of science. It's in the service of that vision of our common humanity. There was a little thread we left, if I might, like the fourth point of the four points, your original question, which had to do with scientifically, what does it mean to look for specifics versus universals? And this is also an yes. old issue in the sciences. And um, I think Charles Darwin first talked about lumpers and splitters. You know, so for example, the 19th century project to understand the natural world, some people were trying to find more and more examples of different species or animals. They were the splitters. And other people were trying to find systematic similarities between different, you know, why are these animals all like this? What's explaining that? They're the lumpers, right? And the same holds true with many other branches of science, whether it's histology or astronomy, uh, you know, or chemistry, you know, why are the noble gases all similar? You know, we're not just going to find another noble gas and another noble gas. and another. There's something similar about the noble gases, a lumper. Well, they all have filled electron shells and they're very inert and so forth. Or, you know, or, you know, sodium and potassium. Why are they similar and not dissimilar and so on? So, so, uh, so this, this issue of lumpers versus splitters also applies in the social sciences. For example, in anthropology, there was people who were interested, you know, during the 19th century, the, the anthropologists fanned out around the world to say, look at all this great human variety. Look at all these different societies. They're, let's do richly ethnographically describe each of these societies. It's so interesting and rich and different. These people are different than those people are different than those people. And let's really understand each one is distinct. Okay, that is fascinating and important. But there was another strand 
which said, no, look, all of these societies have sports. You know, all of these societies have, have deities. All of these societies have adornment, personal adornment, and so on and, and so forth. You know, these are the lumpers. You know, say, well, these are the similarities. So there was a tradition of, of looking at universality in the social sciences as well for the last couple of hundred years. And, um, and, uh, and, uh, and so that's a, that's a kind of methodologic um, aspect to the question you asked. I actually have one other thing that I just wanted to mention if I could, and then I'll shut up. Uh, and by the way, you really like, you actually took us to our next question. Very, yes. like, we were, but yeah, but go on. Go. Uh, go. Well, I was just going to say, you know, Blueprint is aspires to like be on the shelf, like right next to um, Jared Diamond's Guns, Germs, and Steel, and mm -hmm. Stephen Pinker's, you know, um, sort of better angels of our nature in a way. Yeah. Uh, because you could make the argument, and Steve does make this argument, that um, that it is because of the Enlightenment, because of of Enlightenment philosophers, because of the philosophical and scientific advances of the Enlightenment, that human beings are so better off today, that the philosophical principles of, of human equality and democracy, now, even though these were imperfectly applied and took a while to spread out and be applied to all groups equally, I understand the critique, those critiques. But nevertheless, the you know the, one of the reasons slavery was finally eliminated from the planet, and incidentally, there are still it's not fully eliminated. There are forty million people that are slaves today. There are more slaves today than there were during the American Civil War around the world, and there there are countries in the world, including in Africa, with chattel slavery, where if you're born, you can be born a slave. You're the whole, you're the property of other people. So there are tens of millions of people that live in various forms of slavery, not just sexual trafficking, but other kinds of slavery in the world today. And it doesn't get as much attention as it should. But nevertheless, the, 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 this institution of slavery, which had been around for thousands of years in, the, in, in human history, uh, the Vikings had slaves, the Romans had slaves, Americans had slaves, this goes on and on, was finally brought to heel because, I believe, because, and it's been shown, uh, because of enlightenment philosophical principles that start in Europe and spread around the world. And that's coupled with scientific advances uh, in chemistry and physics, for example, the steam engine and so on that make our material circumstances so much better. So that now two or 300 years later, the world is more peaceful and, uh, and, and people live longer. We live in a better world, Stephen argues, as a product of the enlightenment. And that's true. But what I'm trying to do is trying to say the following. We don't just need to look to recent history to get an account of a good life in the last two or 300 years. Deeper, more ancient, more powerful forces are at work propelling a good society, providing a predicate for and a model for how to live a good life, providing us and equipping us for love and friendship and cooperation and teaching and all these wonderful qualities. And that those, that those forces go back hundreds of thousands of years and they are evolutionary forces. They're encoded in us. Yes. And the argument that I make is, is that the arc of our evolution is long, but it bends towards goodness. Mm. And that is that, you know, that is what I'm attempting to do in, in, um, in blueprint. Because I, I got to say that actually, like I marked here to um, uh, get into the methodological side of it. And I, I do want to open it because I think it's really interesting how you go about finding or, you know, basically, how do you make this argument? But it also reminded me of a recent uh, XKCD comic strip that I love, uh, which is the difference between lumpers and splitters. It has the, uh, the lumper saying, well, we're just two people looking for taxonomies, aren't we? And the splitter says, oh, that's exactly what a lumper would say. <laughs> yes. So. Hold on. I want to find the cartoon. One second. <laughs> he says, really? We're both just categorization pedants, lumper? Ah, so you're a meta lumper. <laughs> <laughs> so as part of the search to find the bedrock of social interactions, you propose the social suite, which is a list of distinct features of the human capacity 
to develop connections or distinct types of connections. So do you mind going over these and also explain why you saw them as discrete types of connection and why they're so fundamental rather than, you know, situational contingencies? Uh, <laughs> that's I. That's, you know, now you want me to be a splitter and like, uh, and, <laughs> and list all of these individual attributes. All right, hold on. Let me just uh, compose my thoughts here. And uh, yeah, let me make the argument. So um, yeah. what you're asking me to do is to summarize one of the key sets of ideas that I try to advance. And, um, and, and, what, I, and what I try to advance is that, well, what, I, what I'm trying in essence to argue is that the genes don't just shape the structure and function of our bodies, um, our anatomy and our physiology. Genes also don't just shape the structure and function of our minds, our behaviors, for example, but the genes shape the structure and function of our societies, that there's a way in which our evolution has shaped us to live in a particular way. Now, I make a whole bunch of arguments as to how we know this and why this is true. For example, I show that other social mammals, like whales and elephants, with whom we share our last common ancestor was 80 to 90 million years ago with those species. And that, that animal did not live socially. Elephants have friendship like we do, incidentally. And they make social networks like we do. And they evolve this by independent convergent evolution. Why? Why do the elephants make social networks like this mathematical structure similar to ours? You know, many animals have sex with each other. We do too, we mate with each other. But we do something else that's extremely rare in the animal kingdom is that we form long-term non-reproductive unions with other members of our species. Namely, we have friends. I don't know if you've ever asked yourself, why do we have friends? Why do human beings have friends? Other animals don't do this weird thing. We do it. Certain other primates do it. Elephants do it. Certain cetacean species do it. It's amazing. We evolved the capacity for friendship. So, so natural selection, you see, has shaped not just the structure and function of our bodies, not just the structure and function of our minds, but also the structure and function of our societies. And the argument is that there are these core features that natural selection has, has shaped that allow us to live socially. And these features I call the social suite, and there are, and there are eight of them. The first is the, which we touched on earlier, the first is the capacity to, to have and recognize individual identity. That you, in order to live socially, ironically, we have to be able to be a unique individual. The second is the fact that we love our partners and our offspring. We feel a sent. We're not the only animals that do this, but we do. We feel a sentimental attachment to individuals we have sex with. Well, why? Why don't we just, you know, have sex? We feel attached to our partners. And incidentally, there's fascinating speculation as to the difference in origin of male versus female attachment. You know, which we can talk about. I mean, the speculation is sort of interesting scientifically. It's difficult to prove, but uh, there's some interesting ideas about about that. Uh, okay, can you give it in first uh, uh, a brief version of that? Yeah, I'm curious. Well, it, the idea is that that in in the case of women, um, the the love that women eventually like like in our primate past, uh, we. Um, we might have just made it and then separated and, and, and fathers made very little contribution to the survival of their offspring. Uh, but at some point it became advantageous for females to be able to keep the males involved in the raising of their offspring. But uh, for this, everyone needed to be able to recognize each other. The, the female needed to be able to track who the male was that was the father of her offspring. Now, the first thing to evolve, the argument goes, was the recognition of your own offspring. In other words, a female clearly would want to breastfeed the, uh, her own offspring and not someone else's offspring. Although, well, I mean, there's wrinkles on wrinkles in all of this, but anyway, let me just stay on this thread. Uh, and so the recognition of offspring is very common in the mammals. You know, rats also recognize their offspring. Uh, they do it, by the way, by recognizing the location of their offspring. Uh, mobile animals like sheep recognize them by smell. So when a sheep is born, it immediately starts walking in a big herd. How does a mother recognize the baby and the baby recognize the mother? So the mother only feeds her own, you know, kid, not someone else's kid. And the, the kid can nurse from its own mother, not from someone else's mother. So we've all the mothers evolved the capacity to recognize their offspring and the offspring of mothers, which is basically a sentimental attachment between, between the mother and the offspring. 
And the argument was, is that probably what happened at some time in the evolutionary past is this special feeling that the mothers had for the, their offspring eventually became to apply to their male partners. We can come hmm. we can talk about homosexuality too, if you want, which is another very interesting topic. But right now we're talking about uh, sort of, um, uh, you know, reproductive unions in, that, in, the, in the biological ancestral past. So basically the idea is, is that the argument is that the love that uh, females feel for males in our species with whom they're reproducing is just an extension of the love they used to feel for their babies. And so in some way, it's, yes, exactly, exactly, Vanessa, exactly. It's like, you know, on the one hand, yuck. For those who didn't see, I made a face. Yes, on the one hand, exactly. <laughs> on the one hand, yuck. And on the other hand, also, you know, actually the guys are often are kind of babies. You know, I can, I, can, I can see that. Okay. Now the story for males is a little bit, is a little bit more confusing. Why, why would the males... Why and how would the males evolve this capacity to feel a sentimental attachment to the females? This is these are attempts to reconstruct these things, right? right. It's difficult to find, difficult to prove this, but there's evidence of different kinds that I review in the book. And here the idea is that initially what happened is, is that the males evolved capacity in our ancestral past, the primates long millions of years ago, to, to, to recognize territory and mark territory. So they would compete with other males. This is my territory. This is your territory. And the parts of the brain, uh, so in other words, and, and there, there's some MRI studies that have been done when, when women are asked to think about their sexual partners or their babies, like a similar part of the brain will light up, you know, uh, as if they're thinking about their partners as babies. And, uh, and for males, uh, similar when they're asked to think about their female partners, <laughs> parts of their brain related to territoriality light up. Hmm. It's like... First, they evolved the capacity to recognize and form an attachment to this piece of land. And then they use that, art, that apparatus that had evolved, just like feathers is called an exaptation. When we evolve one feature like feathers, initially it's felt for insulation. And then we use that feature for a completely new purpose like flight, right? So there are many famous examples in evolutionary biology of this topic. So the idea is that these psychological features of love are acceptations of other prior qualities like recognizing offspring or recognizing territory and, and feeling attached to offspring or territory, and that this might even have been gendered in the way that we're discussing, which raises all kinds of, you know, from unsettling, uh, let's just say, good questions, you know. Right. So, but then the preferential uh, provisioning that this created is cemented it as an evolutionary efficient path. Well, what happens is it becomes adaptive. So it becomes adaptive. And then we go down this path where we love each other, where we feel a sentimental attachment to people we reproduce with. And certainly we don't just love our sexual partners. That's another whole topic. But I'm right. talking now just narrowly about the fact that we, we, we feel this dyadic bond, which is a fundamental social bond and is a key part of social living, you know, that most human beings are partners wish to be partnered and go through life partner. Now there are many exceptions and culture plays a huge role in this and we can talk about it. But fundamentally, if you, for example, look at chimps, look at our nearest animal, bonobos. Uh, bonobos, by the way, are very sexually promiscuous. But anyway, if you look at uh, our, our primate analogs, you find evidence for these types of, of, of qualities. So the second part of the social suite is, first is identity, the second is love. The third is friendship, which I mentioned already, which is we don't just mate with each other, we befriend each other, which is very distinctive. Every, every human society has friendship, so universal, and fascinatingly so. Um, and the fact that you feel, you know, you, you feel wonderful in the company of your friends, you know, like it, it's so soothing to you and you seek out their company and you can count on them. Every human being knows this feeling. People, people can die from lacking friends, from lacking this feeling of connection. Um, so it, it is a very physiologic, innate kind of desire and capacity that we have. And this capacity for friendship then gives rise to social networks, which are these higher order structures in which we are embedded. So it's not just about each of us has our own distinct friends, the three of us on this call, for example, but then everyone to whom you're connected also has friends. And Every human being in the free exercise of this desire 
we assemble ourselves into these higher order structures called networks, which networks are like the ant colonies. Like they have these all, their own properties, like a colony of ants. The ants act independently, but they give rise to this ant colony, which is like a super organism, which, which has its own properties distinct from the individual properties. So human networks have properties. For example, we could each of us have friendships in a different way, and we could organize ourselves into one architecture of social ties, which architecture is very prone to epidemic disease. Like we could organize ourselves one way such that diseases would spread very easily in our group. Or you take the same people and the same number of connections and organize them in a different way. And now that network would not be, germs would not spread easily. Though that's a higher order property of social networks. It's not about the connections each of us has. It's about how we're all organized together that can give this group, this organization, certain features. For example, the capacity to spread germs or information or the capacity to work together to achieve certain objectives. These are all topics of research in my laboratory. So, so that's social networks. That's like the fourth thing, which is a, a higher order thing than friendship alone. Then we have cooperation, our capacity to cooperate. Many animals cooperate. Certain bacterial species cooperate uh, to you know, work together to, to create, uh, to repel invaders, to create slime, for example, that insulates them from outsiders and so on. So it's not just sophisticated animals like us that cooperate, but it's, it's a feature of us. Not every animal cooperates. But we do. And it's interesting that we do, and it's highly relevant to our ability to live together. That's the, another element of the social suite. The next is uh, the preference for one's own group or so-called in-group bias that we, and this is depressing, but it's a true aspect that we prefer the company of people we resemble. We prefer the company of our own group. Um, and we often hold uh, negative views of other groups. Why? This is a universal. Everyone does this. Um, there's no, no group in our society which is especially dignified or principled or worthy of respect. Every single group is racist, you know, every group, unfortunately, and um, or ethnocentric or however you want to think about or tribal. You know, they think our, my group is special. Uh, and this is a very depressing observation about human beings. But we but it's also has played its role in our evolution. Hmm. Yeah, it's the oxymoron of my group is best because we're not tribal. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, but yes, exactly. You are. Then there is um, another quality of the social suite is something called what I call mild hierarchy, which is we are inexorably a hierarchical animal, but not too hierarchical. Well, not fully egalitarian, nor are we too authoritarian or autocratic. We don't want too much inequality or too much hierarchy. We all resent it. And we, we have evolved to live in groups with mild hierarchy, which, as it turns out, benefits everybody. Uh, and I discuss the ways in which that's the case in the yeah. book. And, and finally, we have this miracle of, uh, of social learning and teaching that we, um, we evolve to be able to learn from each other. And, and this, is, this is the root of, of human culture and the root of all our wealth and the root of our civilization, that we, we have the capacity for cumulative culture, which is innate to us. Now, certain other animals have similar things, not, none quite as sophisticated as humans, this capacity for culture. Um, and the way to understand this is to understand that just like most every sexually reproducing animal has sex with each other, uh, almost every animal can learn from contact with its environment. A little fish in the sea can learn that if it swims up to the light, it'll find food there. That's called independent learning, where the organism learns by contact with its environment, reinforcement, and so on. But some animals, much, many fewer, can learn socially by observing conspecifics. So, for example, you put your hand in the fire and you learn that it burns. That's independent learning. Or I watch you put your hand in the fire and I learn that it burns. And uh, now I, I've acquired almost as much knowledge about how bad fire is for my hand, but I paid none of the price. I didn't burn my hand. You did. That is incredibly efficient social learning. Uh, or, you know, we were going into the woods and you eat red berries and die. And I watch you eat red berries and die. And now I learn, don't eat red berries. That's incredibly efficient. That's social learning, imitation, mimicry, and so on. That's less common, much less common in the animal kingdom, but many animals do that too. But we do something that's extraordinarily rare in the animal kingdom, 
which is we teach each other things. It's not just that you teach me to build a fire. It's not just that like I passively watch you put your hand in the fire. You just tell me, don't put your hand in the fire. You teach me what to do. And this is exceptionally rare in the animal kingdom, this teaching function. We do it, elephants do it, certain cetacean species, certain primates, and certain other weird animals or some, which I won't go into right now, but it's exceptionally rare. And this capacity for teaching is actually a kind of altruism. It's a kind of kindness that we show each other. We share our knowledge with each other. And, um, and it's this capacity that lies at, gives us the ability to have culture and to accumulate knowledge, to distribute knowledge over time and space, such that all three of us alive today are the beneficiaries of knowledge that was invented and shared by people thousands and then hundreds of years ago. You know, when you are born into the world, animals have already been domesticated. You don't have to domesticate pigs and cows and sheep. Calculus has already been invented. You're just taught calculus. You know, the periodic table has already been figured out. You don't have to do that. It was bequeathed to you by our ancestors. The, you know, the, the electrons, the everything, the roads have been, you know, the road making technology, the cement making technology, the uh, knowledge of the stars and navigation. All of these things have been worked out and given to us by our ancestors. It's extraordinary. I mean, it's just mind boggling. And, in, and it, it's what, it, it is one of the key things that has made us, you know, the so-called ascended species on the planet. Yeah, I also th- always thought that making bread is, is probably the most impressive miracle of human evolution. Just, just think of the billion of steps and time that it took for people to greet that perfect result. <laughs> yes. And to be perfect, everything from the oven making to the leavening to the to the flour milling, to the domestication of the wheat, you know, I mean, a huge amount of it. Mm. So I I have a, this might be a bit of an oddball question, but I mean, when we, I remember when you were talking earlier about, you know, for example, in like totalitarian societies where there was an emphasis, you know, like let us degrade the, the connection between you and others so that you can kind of sublimate supposedly to this higher calling. Um, Is there a connection between, in your estimation, societies that, better accommodate for these kind of universal human uh, evolutionarily pre- predetermined qualities and then by by the formation of the society kind of allows for a bit more success success i suppose yes. because people are more able to yes. practice these practices yes uh, that's an argument that i make a little bit it's not the central argument but i exactly right i think that those political arrangements that work with our evolutionary tendencies are more apt to be successful than those political arrangements that attempt to subvert. Now you can do it for a while, right? Like you can, uh, I mean, I, for example, I give the example of kibbutzes. I, I mean, I give many examples. You get into utopias, which is actually something that I did yeah. hope to get into. You know, some, some of those, like we don't need to go to totalitarian regimes. We can go to just groups that try to create what we tell ourselves is a better version of, right. of, of human interaction and, and try to eradicate the aspects of our humanity that we're not comfortable with. And you mentioned how, going, uh, like buying into the theory that the root cause of male love is effectively possessive. And that explains a lot. For instance, you can understand je- discrepancy in jealousy patterns, for instance. And you'd understand why planned societies, utopian societies, would try to eradicate this impulse, but ultimately attempts to do so run against the social suite and are doomed to fail. Yeah, I review, I review in the book, I review unintentional communities like shipwrecks and intentional communities like communes and utopian movements and then artificial communities like that we experiment with in the lab and online and so on, and to support some of the arguments. But just to pick up the thread on utopian society. So, so the love of one's partner and children was often seen as a threat, either because it caused misery, right? Like the fact that we, there's so much human suffering comes from wanting people, loving people that you can't have or relationships that break up and so much sadness comes from this or that the, our, you know, we, we, we lose the ability to work as a large group because we feel special attachment to particular individuals So as you point out, the attempts have been to create communitarian societies that lack this feature. Now, interestingly, they've gone to one of two extremes. On the one hand, you might have like the shakers, which prohibit sex, for example, between uh, members of the group and uh, try to sort of 
stop people from having intimate. And the Shakers had very intimate friendships, by the way, but they tried to break down. Can they have sex outside of the group? No, 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 there's sex no sex, no abstinence. no sex, no abstinence. Sex is bad. It just leads to misery, you know, and every human being has had the experience of sex leading to misery. And so, you know, it's, it's very evocative. You can sort of understand why, gee, I mean, I guess if I had no desire and didn't have any kind of sexual interactions with anybody, I, you know, I, I'd lose something, but I'd also gain a lot. Let's try that. You know, let's, let's get rid of that, you know, so that's all the joys of celibacy. Yes. So that's the one extreme. And the other extreme is the kind of polyamory, the, uh, which is actually a very dissimilar solution to the similar problem, which says, okay, instead of forming a particular attachment to a particular person, we'll all have sex with everyone else. <laughs> and regarding polyamory, you actually say something that in the book, something that I, I love, which connects to the Russ Dothert argument about decadence, which is you, we see that in order to sustain a system like polyamory, you actually need a lot more rules yes. and artificial contracting than, than your average monogamous relationship. Yes, that's right. They, they, to have a successful polyamorous grouping, it requires actually a lot more effort also, because it's unnatural in a way. So, and I'm not saying, by the way, just to be very clear, I'm talking about social arrangements. I'm not talking about individuals, right? So particular people who wish to be polyamorous, they absolutely should have that right. They should practice what they wish. We live in a free society. They can find other individuals who want to do that. I'm not making any moral judgments, nor am I making any political prescriptions. I'm just describing evolutionary capacities that we have. And so, so this, this capacity we have or desire we have uh, for these types of dyadic relationships, and incidentally, we, we also love outside of reproduction, their homosexual unions and so on. Um, these, these, um, this, these capacities that we have are, um, are uh, can some communitarian societies try to stop them by, let's say, the shakers going to abstinence or certain of these communes going to polyamory, both of which are trying to address, as I said, the same problem, which is we don't want you to love one particular person, right? That's bad for our group. So we want to stop that. So you can't have sex with anyone or you must have sex with everyone, you know, either extreme as it were. So, so yes, yeah, so that is, so, and, and, it, it, and so we don't have to look for authoritarian regimes which are trying to regulate, you know, like, or certain cults, for example, where the leader picks everyone's, uh, you know, mates, you know, we don't have to um, look for uh, those examples. We can look for more ordinary examples. And there are many communes as well. Like I said, collective child rearing, Plato talks about this, that, Collective child rearing has been repeatedly tried because it has rightly been identified this, the attachment women feel to their offspring and fathers too, by the way, has been rightly identified as a barrier to the equality between the sexes in this in idealized utopian societies where many people would rightly want women and men to be treated equally. But there's a fundamental biological difference between men and women, which is the women give birth to children. And you know, that this has been seen as a threat to these, some of these utopian commitments. And so the solution that has independently been discovered by many people is to say, well, why don't we just provide, you know, creches, we'll provide places where someone, there'll be professional care of the children so that the women and men can be on equal footing. This has never worked. Uh, it's always after a period of time collapsed. And, and it's because it's going against our nature. So those political arrangements that go with our nature are more apt to survive. And Stasi, you know, like the Stasi Eastern Germany example, you know, yes, with a lot of effort, you can really cultivate, suppress humans' desire for friendship, make it, them really afraid to have friends for fear of being ratted out. But it, it takes an enormous force to, uh, to oppose this uh, motion, uh, this, this desire, and it cannot be sustained indefinitely. Uh, eventually it, it collapses. So a question that I, I keep asking myself, and I'm going to ask you, when you were coming up with these principles, where and how did you draw the lines? Because, for instance, there's a theme that keeps coming up. In, in my view, other ideas may be sprouting from it, and that's the human ability to create individuation and separation and ultimately inequality circles back to our first point of discussion. It's, it's just inequality is foundational in human experience. And also that's why all the attempts by utopian societies to extinguish this instinct towards inequality and individuation have failed. 
But if you don't want to go into inequality again, a different example of why I think maybe some of the ideas of the social suite might be a manifestation of a, a more foundational idea, we can look at the transferring of knowledge. Uh, how much is this a discrete concept or how much is it the result of the authority principle? It's our proclivity to trust certain sources of authority more than others to put our faith in the tribe's elders or priests or scribes that is actually at play in our ability to transfer knowledge. Well, uh, first of all, I was going to joke that you want to be a lumper instead of a splitter on my social suite and group, uh, <laughs> and group some together. And, and, and I yeah, yeah, you're too much of a splitter for me. Yeah, I, and I'm not sure I agree with that. And we can talk about that. And I, I try to explain that. But on the, um, on the authority thing, I do discuss that in terms of teaching. So there are different kinds of, of um, hierarchical ways of organizing social animals. And there are sort of status hierarchies in which the dominant animal achieves its dominance because of the penalties that it can impose on its subordinates. So like I'm bigger than you, so I beat you up uh, and therefore I'm dominant. And, um, and many mammals do this, you know, uh, bull elef uh, uh, bulls, uh, elephant seals and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, deer with big antlers and, uh, you know, all kinds of creatures, uh, you know, the bigger animal is, has, is higher up in the totem pole because they, um, you know, they can impose costs on their subordinates. But some animals, us included, have a parallel kind of hierarchy, which is called prestige hierarchy. And here, it's, it's not the cost you can impose on your subordinates. And in, and in status hierarchies, um, the subordinate animals try to avoid their superordinates, right? Stay away from this top dog because they could punish me. In prestige hierarchies, subordinates seek out their superordinates because of the benefits they can confer. And that is what teaching comes in. In other words, we share information and this gives us a parallel means of having hierarchy. In other words, someone who knows a lot is someone who's sought out by others. You know how to make a cabinet or repair a car or do statistical analyses. And you have specialized skills that you can transmit and create a benefit for your subordinates. And here your subordinates come close to you. They wish to be near you in order to acquire this and revere you, not because of what harm you can impose on them, but rather what benefits you can offer them. And so this is uncommon uh, in animals. Uh, some species have this type of prestige hierarchy. We have it. And it is a counterpoint. You know, there are different ways of, of, uh, of, uh, uh, you know, achieving success in our in our society or having power, and one of them it comes through not just being stronger, let's say, but also being smarter, and 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 that is a key feature of our of our species. In other words, you say it works in reverse too. The some of the the success of transmission or a desire for successful transmission of knowledge can be the cause of hierarchy rather than the other way around. So I see Vanessa is itching to ask you about COVID and and your book. Apollo's arrows. But before getting there, I'll be remiss if I, I don't mention the infamous YouTube video now that we're like six years away, right? And in a stupid way, it seems to be bringing together both our themes of lumpers versus splitters and uh, the, the trouble of transmitting knowledge. I think it's interesting to dwell on this video, which was almost like a litmus test or a moment where reality shattered into alternative narratives or, or parallel worlds where never the twain shall meet in how people interpreted what they saw. It was as if half the people watching the video saw young, brave kids fighting for justice, and others saw a decent professor trying to reach out to a mob of petulant children. And this moment basically set in motion the stupid spiral of culture war asininity that, that we have been entrenched in. You're, we're six years almost to the day from that event. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that legacy that you have <laughs> unwittingly participated in? Well, I can't speak 
to the larger, you know, uh, many of your listeners won't know, thankfully will not know what you're talking about. Uh, and you would not have been remiss had you not brought it up. It would have been fine for you not to bring it up. I, I think it would be remiss. I suspect that some number of our listeners would expect at least. Oh, I see. At least some acknowledgement of the incident. Well, I just happened to, you know, walk into a propeller. I mean, I've been a professor my whole life. I think my people can look up my history. They can look up my commitments. They can judge how good I or not good I am as a scientist. They can judge how good or bad is my character. They can they can judge um, my commitments and my actions over my lifetime. You know, I was a hospice doctor who took care of dying people in the south side of Chicago for many years, primarily minority communities, very poor indigent communities. I took my my bag and I went out and I took care of people who were dying at home, you know, often in very demanding circumstances. And uh, and I and I I have tried to uh, live a life of meaning and purpose and one that's also committed to certain core values. These include a vision of our common humanity and they also include certain commitment to civil society, which includes the principles in the Bill of Rights, like um, free expression, for example. Now, I'm not, it's not just a political idea, it's a belief. In fact, you could argue that like the things we were talking about earlier, like in order to teach and learn from each other, we have to create the widest possible circle of interlocutors who can speak to each other with the freest and most open discourse, else we will not learn. And so, um, so there is some commitment between some connection between my scientific discoveries and interests and my philosophical beliefs and my political commitments, although they're loose, these interactions. Anyway, what you're alluding to is a situation where we, I walked into a propeller about five or six years ago at Yale and, uh, you know, there uh, was attempting to defend the right of students to express themselves as they saw fit and to have students sorted out among themselves. And this, you know, was racialized in a certain particular way, mostly by others, I would argue, and, um, you know, contributed, hit a particular cultural moment or served as an instant in our, in the larger debate that was taking place in our society. And I, uh, you know, I have, I, uh, I almost never discuss it publicly. My wife and I were just, you know, quiet about it. We, we I wrote, I wrote one piece uh, about it uh, and just one piece. And I, uh, you know, just don't discuss it. I just will say we did our best in coping with what were very challenging circumstances uh, where I think the students misjudged us badly and acted tremendously immaturely. Uh, and, um, and um, you know, we, we tried to, uh, to deal with it. And as you're alluding to, it was a, uh, an event that was part of a broader set of social happenings. Um, and so anyway, thankfully that's far behind me. Yeah. And I think I should just let you know where I'm coming from on this issue. It's just that as a, as a journalist and one that deeply values the academic tradition, uh, in my case, coming from studying history, I've been in touch with Back in, I'm talking about 2012, 2011, I've been in touch with a lot of uh, professors in elite uh, American universities who have been talking to me off the record about the constraints that were growing around them where it came to discussing certain topics or certain limitations in, in favor of an ever-shifting concept of uh, student sensitivity. I'm talking about literature professors that weren't able to teach certain texts or history professors that weren't allowed to touch certain historical periods, even ones that they were experts in. And they felt betrayed by their own universities that had failed to protect the, the core principles of an open exchange of ideas and free inquiry. No, I think, I mean, academia has done a terrible job of defending these principles writ lately. Exactly. And the sense that I was getting from the people that I was talking to that they weren't willing to come forward w with any of this because they you know, were scared for their job. But then naively, I, I thought it's when I saw your video that this is it. This is such an absurd display that surely 
it, it will release the pressure from this subject and and everybody will realize how how silly all of this is and it will start a process of amelioration and there's going to be a chance to discuss it openly but as it turned out i i think it actually led to the worst version of narrative splitting mm-hmm. where the right just turned it into the dumbest rallying cry against the woke that, that wasn't the verb at the time i think but it doesn't matter well in the same time on the left people took it as an excuse to be even more shrill and obstinate and now you see writers and, and thinkers as far up as the new york times saying that maybe free speech shouldn't be sacrosanct after all no it's they're insane those people are totalitarians and they're to be they're to be resisted powerfully resisted people who who try to um uh, put an axe to the root of free expression in our society that is the path of totalitarianism whether from the left or the right and it must be resisted uh the uh the, the i was in the courtyard for about 90 minutes video footage from multiple angles has now been released by many people uh mm-hmm. there's uh um jamie kerchick a journalist published in the i think the in, in tablet magazine i think published a, a lot of footage uh and uh you know i there, there there are a few things i wish i had done differently but by and large i think i I kept my cool and I was trying to dignify the students and take their arguments seriously and uh, try to treat them as adults and say, you know, here's why I I disagree with this or I agree with that or whatever. Um, I would seriously doubt that any of the students present would be very proud of their behavior. At least I would hope they wouldn't be proud of their behavior. Um, Now, as to the expedient use by the left and the right of events that day, you know, that's not nothing I can do about that. No, 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 of course, of course. No, no, I, I, I'm just lamenting. It's not if it, if it oh, comes. No, but you're right. I mean, that you, would think that, you would think that you would think that. I thought that you were such a great representative of the of that pent up pressure that I was getting a sense of from talking to professors, especially in elite schools at the time. A sense of intellectual suffocation. I was thinking about professors having to completely expunge and butlerize their their curriculums because certain topics, yes. in parts of the literary and historic canon, were deemed inappropriate or offensive or just afraid to step into it because they knew that the administration wasn't going to take their side. And again, I seeing your video just filled me momentarily and uh, abortively with hope that we're at the pivotal moment and that we're going to shift away from the momentary panic. But it clearly didn't. And maybe it was the election of Trump. Maybe it was the destructive power of social media and maybe it was just our David Frenchian tendency towards more and more division, but clearly it it didn't. It was it was just the harbinger of worse to come. And I lament it especially because, for what it's worth, from my humble view, you were possibly the best person to be in that situation to represent this liberal ideal. You were not there to foment culture war drama. You were not there to make yourself the subject of a viral clip. You were actually trying to talk to those students. You were trying to have a real discussion. The sort of dialectic that so many of us took for granted as the soul of the liberal sciences and the soul of the academy, only to be disabused of these quaint ideas by the people you call the authoritarians. Yeah, thank you for saying that. I appreciate that very much. Like I said, we just, I, you know, we, I did my best in what was a very unexpected and challenging moment in my life. And as I said, I'm, I'm really happy that um, I've published two books since then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 you know, a bunch of science that I've done and my lab is thriving <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, everything is, 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 but I still worry about these topics in our society. Yeah. And I still, I am deeply committed to to a to a civil society and to uh, certain liberal principles. I will, do not reject those principles, and I am very worried by threats to free expression from the right and the left. I mean, yeah. right. Let's not forget there are many state legislatures right now that are seeking to regulate what books can be read. I mean, literally, with these people who learn nothing. You know, they're like banning books. Like, how bad a look is that? Uh, mm-hmm. You know, you can't you can't read. Uh, uh, and in defense of free speech, often. That's yeah, the, well, that's no, no. I mean, sometimes they I'm, say that, but it's. I am. I am sarcastic. Yes. No, I know it's ridiculous. <laughs> Dripping like, with sarcasm. Yes, exactly. Like you can't read the color purple, you know, or I mean, mm. ridiculous, 
ridiculous. You can't read Harry Potter. I mean, these people are nuts. Uh, and of course, the right wing legislators have a lot more power. And then on the far left, you've got similar problems, you know, where you ban books. You can't read To Kill a Mockingbird. Yes. Just ridiculous. I mean, just it's really hard. ridiculous. It, it, it's heartbreaking. I, and I think I have the a foreigner's, na still a foreigner's mm. naivete about the, about the U.S. as the Tocquevelian experiment where you mm. join in and you sign on the Bill of Rights. And, and that implies a lot of yes. um, capacity for, ten for social political tensions and disagreements, but acceptance of them, importantly. And the lack of that, the decline of pluralism and, and, and its mm. impact specifically on academic institutions, those are where it's supposed to be at, at its highest ferment of intellectual debate and experiment. Mm. It's, just, it's just, I can't, I can't help but use the word again. Like, it's heartbreaking to me. Um, but I'm I, sorry that I imposed that, that old... Viral mode. Oh, that's okay. It's part of my part. Of, it's become part of my biography now. And so, you know, sometimes people ask me and, you know, I say what I can and we can move on. <laughs> well, let's, well, yeah, let's talk, I mean, let's talk about a little bit about your most recent book, um, Apollo's Arrow. On this theme of us, you know, uh, di a divided society at present and then enter COVID. When you were talking earlier about, you know, like aliens coming down to, <laughs> to the planet and being the the outside force that should hopefully rally and uh, dissolve the internal conflicts. I guess w one of my questions to you is why wasn't COVID that kind of force? Why wasn't it like the aliens coming down to the planet to to get us in gear and to coordinate and cooperate. Well, you're it's a solution. It's a very normal and natural question to ask, you know, why is Yeah. why isn't this virus seen as an alien force that is uh right. is bonding us together? Why aren't we united against a common enemy in the coronavirus? Well, you might or might not be surprised to hear that you're not the first person to have this thought sure. uh, about how <laughs> about how shouldn't we unite to fight the germ? Uh here is um because observers have long recognized that an epidemic might force people to see their common interest. And there was, in fact, a devastating plague in Rome in the third century of the Common Era that was killing about 5,000 people a day. Rome was a huge city of over a million inhabitants. Um, just astonishing, actually. And, um, and, uh, and uh, there was an observer, St. Cyprian, who I'm going to read something now that I happen to have handy. He said, yeah, sure. it disturbs some that this mortality is common to us with others. And yet what is there in this world which is not common to us with others? So long as we are here in the world, we are associated with a human race in fleshly equality. So St. Cyprian, 1700 years ago, is articulating a variant of your question, uh, which is, you know, when we're under the shared threat, we're all dying from this germ. Couldn't we unite to fight the germ? So you're right to ask that question. And um, and the answer is that yes, it does. We do unite. There is cooperation. There are ways, clearly ways, in which we have used our capacity for cooperation and for teaching and learning. By the way, we've used our skills to fight the virus. And one of the things, one of the ways I like to think about this, and this is some work we do in my lab, where we study the the evolutionary origins and the mathematical structure and the social function of human social networks and human social interactions. You can think that that um, that the germ is following these network ties. It spreads from me to you, and from you to Adam, and from Adam to his uh, partner, and it just keeps spreading. Right? That's this germ is spreading across social ties. So we, so you might want to think about the fact that the spread of germs is the price we pay for the spread of ideas. Earlier, we were talking about how we come together to share information, that the spread of ideas is such a fundamental feature of our humanity. But, but by coming near you in order to learn from you, I not only expose myself to risk of violence, you know, you might beat me or, or steal from me, but I also expose myself to a risk of um, you might infect me with a germ. And so... We've argued that natural selection has balanced these qualities, the costs and benefits of to shape, to give rise to a structure of human social interaction, which is optimized. You know, it says, on the one hand, you gain information when you go near Adam. On the other hand, or Vanessa, 
when you go near Vanessa, you you gain information. That's great, but you you know you also get germs when you go near Vanessa. And uh, and uh, so you know overall, you know how should you approach Vanessa or not? And should you form connections with how many people or not? And so cost benefit. Cost benefit. So so but here's the thing: the spread of germs is the price we pay for the spread of ideas. But equally, it is the spread of ideas that will allow us to control the spread of germs and the sharing of information and the working together. And this has been appreciated for hundreds of years. You know, the, the, the Venetians during the bubonic plague invented quarantine to like keep people offshore. You know, they worked together to build these like castles where incoming ships would have to spend 40 days to make sure they weren't carrying the plague and so on. Uh, or, this, or now we're seeing with the invention of the vaccines. These vaccines, the reason we're able to fight back the coronavirus to any extent at all is that we are capable of cumulative culture. And thousands of scientists and tens of thousands of patients have willingly volunteered, have altruistically said, I'll sign up for the trial to help my fellow human being. This is, these are these wonderful qualities that we have that will allow us to fight back uh, the germ. So, of course, if you share the Jared Diamond nostalgia, you could say that, well, all of this could have been prevented if we just did not exist in, in human civilization. I wouldn't, uh, would you really describe his position as nostalgia? I wouldn't say that. I think there's an, uh, like, yeah, my, my take, there's an undercurrent of Rousseauian nostalgia and That's, frustration with you're, you're, modern civilization. You're, you're if not, only we had no farming, there would be no farm animals to give us diseases. Yeah, I mean, well, obviously, I don't think he's prescribing anything. But but there is a touch of like melancholy uh, where humanity is. You know, it's it's fascinating to hear you with that take. And now, as soon as you offered that opinion, maybe you're right. You know, uh, maybe you're right. He is nostalgic. I don't know. Uh, but uh, but regardless of whether he's nostalgic, I mean, he's he's making sort of arguments uh, and uh, that are fascinating. Yeah, yeah, and, fa- and everybody should read uh, yeah. Guns, Germs, and Steel yeah. after you read Blueprint and that Apollo. After you read right. Blueprint. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Yes, I'm sorry, Vanessa. Did I answer your question? I don't know. Yes, no, no, no. I think you did. I mean, the 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 one thing that I think comes very clear from reading the book is that you know the the evolution of human society has been concurrent with the evolution of pathogens, and they exploit they exploit these very hu- human universal tendencies in the way that we interact with each other, and 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 in fact, they are also evolving. I mean, you talk about the fact that they can they often evolve to be less lethal because that way they can kind of coexist with us much more happily. Yes. Um. So yeah, I mean, but it's still it's still you know it still doesn't necessarily like satisfy me that like our response was so piecemeal and slapdash and uh, and we. You know, we, I think the virus struck us also at a particularly vulnerable moment in our history, at least in the United States, where we already had many political divisions. We had a political polarization that was at a, at a high. We had economic inequality that is at a high. We had a thinning out of our intellectual life, you know, a distrust of experts, a, a suspicion about science. We had all of these background features that had made it difficult for us as a society to right. to soberly assess this threat and work together to confront it. And the virus, as a result, has killed many hundred thousands of extra Americans than it otherwise would have had we been able to get our, our shit together. Uh, mm-hmm. And, um, and you know, I think that is a very unfortunate. Yeah, well, the, the last thing you mentioned in the, the litany of woes is the uh, our mis- mistrust or distrust of of science connects to the is this a collapse of our capacity to to transmit knowledge is it, whether it's the social media or just an, a new social pathogen uh, that you know you see uh, at least in the US when you see a lab coat person in a lab coat you're thinking x files conspiracy theories rather than somebody who, who might have some I mean, knowledge to bequeath. I don't know. There's, there's, you know, I think societies wax and wane in their confidence in institutions, you know, mm. um, and in some sense you could see science as an institution, you know, our confidence in our political leadership, our confidence in our judiciary, you know, do we confidence in the police, confidence in the military, confidence in the priesthood, confidence in scientists, you know, they're different institutions that serve different roles in a society. And societies wax and wane. And I think we are on the ebb right now of uh, a lot of suspicion. You know, we had the, the scandals in the Catholic Church. We have, uh, we have uh, you know, uh, endless scandals with our politicians. We, 
the new media environment means we don't have a kind of whether he was rightly trusted or not, I'm not going to comment, but, you know, there was Walter Cronkite, who everyone got their news and was seen as a sensible, you know, middle of the road kind of honest figure, you know. And now, you know, everyone thinks, well, who knows what, you know, that person is saying, what they want to say or whatever. So uh, what I, you know, what I don't understand, and we're seeing that with the judiciary as well, where there's a kind of politicization of the ju- judiciary and the kind of sentiment that, look, I, I was never so naive as to believe that judges were fully impartial, that judges were perfect, that judges were insulated from the broader society. But mostly I didn't think that in America we had a corrupt judiciary, right? I mean, you know, there are other societies where you've just paid the judge, you get the ruling you want. That was not our society. Uh, or where the judge would- By just, and large. By and large, exactly. By and large. Yes, of course, there are exceptions, of course. Or like, you know, that the idea that there'd be an independent judiciary in China is ridiculous, right? I mean, there's they're all members of the Communist Party and so on. So whereas in our society, I thought, okay, we have an independent, by and large, non-corrupt, you know, judiciary, et cetera. You know, when we begin to lose that, um, that's a problem for our society. When we lose either the perception of it or the certainly the reality of it, uh, you know, or the notion that, like, you'd be surprised how much of our economy runs on trust. You know, like in our, you yes. buy goods and you pay for them later. This is not the Middle Eastern bazaar model. In the bazaar, you're given the goods and you pay for them now. Plus, caveat enter, you can't return the goods. Whereas in our society, it's the, you know, the customer's king. You don't like a product after you paid for it, you can return it. You know, this is a very specific feature of our society. And it's based on trust that all this requires trust, which allows our economy to thrive in certain ways. And supports innovation and everything else. So, so the scientists, you know, I, it's odd to me what's happened with science. You know, when, when once a year, when the uh, chief justice of the Supreme Court goes before Congress to advocate for funding for the federal judiciary, nobody sees that as a self-interested act, right? You don't think there are those judges again, wanting to feed at the public purse, you know, they're just a corrupt bunch of people who want money for their own, you know, special needs, you know, no, we think that, you know, we need a federal judiciary and here's an honest reporter who's saying, you know, we need this many judges and therefore this much money or whatever the the ritual is. Well, it used to be, I think that scientists were seen this way, you know, when the scientists would come and they would say, you know, this is, but now I think that, you know, scientists are just seen as another interest group, you know, feeding the public trough. And I don't think, you know, now I'm well familiar with the critiques of science where science is wrong. Science has been used and exploited. It has been a tool of oppression. I understand all of that. But in principle, you know, in theory, this is not at all what science is about. And and therefore, a, a more thoroughgoing suspicion of science, which ultimately has been at one of the key paths to our security and our wealth, by the way, scientific innovation, um, is very ill-advised to and the, and the importance of perception in that sense that's that's partially self-inflicted and that's like part of Jonathan Rausch's argument about the the liberal sciences you ha- you're causing we have scenes like we just described on in your YouTube incident when you have scenes like that it creates a perception at least that those institutions aren't really committed to that idea of of the liberal scientific project in which case what is it that we're supporting as an institution Yes, I think that's exactly right. Same with higher learning, like you're alluding to. Why is higher learning? You, it's unsustainable. There was just an article, like something like the political tilt in the students and in the professors in these elite institutions is so lopsided now. It's like almost like 40 to 1, something crazy. It's crazy. It's not sustainable. How can you know, in the, oh, these institutions, the institutions of higher learning, rely on the public purse and the bequests of wealthy individuals? And you cannot have this extreme a tilt away from the kind of median voter uh, for it to be sustainable. And you can't also represent that you are committed to one set of principles like free expression and then not honor them and not be therefore seen as a hypocrite and lose credibility in the broader public eye, which public eyes regard you need in order to endure. So, you know, when you when you're no longer, you know, if the military says, give us money and trust us, we're going to defend you. And then if they fail to defend you, you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Your job is to defend us and you're not doing your job. Why should we give you money and confidence? 
And the same is if you're an academic institution, you give us money and confidence, and we will be that portion of our society where there's a free exchange of ideas, that the mission of university is the preservation, production, and dissemination of knowledge. That's our mission. And yet you see instead them becoming ideological or suppressing the dissemination of knowledge, then you know all bets are off and you're, you're, mm-hmm. you're not honoring your core mission. And I think that can subvert it. So, so there is a crisis of confidence, I think, right now. Now, this, just to be clear, there are ebbs and flows of this. It's not the first time in our society we've had like suspicion of scientists. Um, but you're right, I think, to highlight that at this particular moment. Final question. So, and we'll do it, we'll do it super quick. But we, we tend to ask our guests, um, we often ask them what are the blind spots that they see on the left and the right, since it's so difficult to, to be able to both to look at both sides of the political spectrum. But for you, we want to adapt to this question. We want to ask you, what do you think are the biggest blind spots in terms of scientific research? What are the things that the scientific community sci- scientific community is not looking at that you think they should be? Well, I mean, the scientific community is vast and engaged in all kinds of stuff. And I'm just a, a lover of science. I love everything. I love the people who, who study Sanskrit and I love archaeology and and but presumably some blind spots um, affect you or cause you to lose sleep more than others. Well, no, I, I could answer the question more in your customary way than I could in your refined way for me. Uh, you know, like I, sure. I mean, you know, obviously I have my own parochial interest in what should be supported in terms of good science. And, you know, like, um, you know, if I were king and I could allocate research dollars, I would probably rejigger it a little bit. And I, let's say, spend more money on public health and more money on social science, more money on things that I study, uh, you know. Uh, so, yes, I mean, I suppose that's true. But, you know, I think that I think both the right and the left uh, denigrate science when it offers inconvenient truths. And on the right, you know, you have climate change deniers and you have, uh, you have suppression of gun epidemiology. You know, they don't want any research done on uh, the epidemiology of gun violence. Uh, you have many People on the far right, you know, don't want to believe in, uh, you know, stem cell biology. Uh, you know, they don't want that being done because of the connection to abortion or because or evolutionary biology. They don't want to believe in, you know, natural selection or doing it. And on the left, you have people who reject that the, the behavior genetics, you know, that genetics plays a role in human behavior, which is a preposterous position to take or 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 um, gender differences, for example, or in physical anthropology. I mean, on the far left, you have all kinds of. Um, anti-vax on the far left. Let's not forget the anti-vax sentiment was usually a movement on the left, right? And lately it's become a far right phenomenon, but for years it was mostly a far left phenomenon. Um, so, you know, you have people on the left and the right who don't want to believe science when it's inconvenient for their ideology. And, you know, I, I, um, of course I have my own political beliefs. I'm politically on the left, but, uh, but that's, um, but that I believe is independent of my commitment to science. You know, for example, on this issue of the origins of the coronavirus, I don't understand why this has become politicized. I understand, I don't have a commitment to whether it was a leak from a Chinese lab or it was a zoonotic leap. I think it's probably a zoonotic leap if you look at the history of past such pathogens. If I had to guess, it's more likely than not that it was a natural you know, there was some event where someone had contact with a bat and then it um, it came into human population. But it could have been a lab leak. Absolutely, it could have been a lab leak. And we don't have enough evidence to be sure either way right now. And I'm happy, not happy is not the right word. I'm perfectly willing to accept whatever outcome ultimately is the case. I don't. Why on earth would I have a political commitment to this? This is stupid. Uh, it's like people who argue over things to which the answer is no. But just look it up. I mean, why would you argue? <laughs> you know, just... I mean, just go to the dictionary or the encyclopedia or Wikipedia or look up the answer and stop arguing. Uh, so, you know, we don't need to argue about this and we will find the answer and probably, not necessarily. I mean, the answer might never be known. Um, and so I don't have a political stake in this matter. But now we're seeing the left and the right line up on opposite sides of this thing, which is just just pointless and unnecessary, to my, in my view. Thank you for listening to Uncertain Things. Follow us on uncertain.substack.com or wherever you get your podcasts. We are Uncertain Pod on the social media. If you're feeling generous, give us five stars on Apple Podcasts or just share us with your friends and enemies. And until next time, stay sane. 
I I want to I want to ask the blind spots question. So yes, yeah, um, that's that, that that's the conclusion. To be, so before we have our concluding question, I oh, just, you want that to be the conclusion? Yeah, yeah. I question? think it's it's okay. a good it's a good ender. I hope. I hope. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. We'll see. This is like completely breaking the order of the uh, conversation, but it's uh, you know it is what it is. In Blueprint, you write a little bit about your idea of an exo phenotype, which I guess is, is somewhat related to uh, Richard Dawkins's hypothesis of the extended phenotype. So if you can please help guide us through this word salad that I'm making. Yeah, I mean, that. Yeah, this notion of an exo phenotype that I try to advance in Blueprint, uh, it was one of the most exciting and also depressing moments of my scientific career because um, at the time when we had these ideas, I was working with my colleague, James Fowler, and we had been um, thinking about uh, the role of our genes in shaping our social networks. And I began to think about our networks, the spider's web is a metaphor for our networks, that the spider spins a web and we spin a social web. We, we, we rearrange the social world around us and that our genes might play a role in how we arrange that social world, just like the genes of a spider uh, shape the structure of the web that the spider constructs. So I'd had this metaphor in my mind and we had, at the time, James and I had um, read about some, uh, some work in the psychiatric genetics, which began to think about um, psychiatric diseases as what were called endophenotypes. In other words, that inside your body, there was a phenotype, a kind of psychiatric disposition. You were anxious, let's say. It's not manifest mm -hmm. on the surface of your body, but it's an endophenotype. Actually, this word has an older root in, uh, in, insect, in, uh, in insect physiology. But anyway, so... So, uh, and it suddenly dawned on me that we could think about the role of genes outside our bodies and that we might have exophenotypes. In other words, genes might shape, shape how we rearrange the social world around us. Uh, and I thought this was an amazing idea. And we began to really work hard on this idea and try to, we published a whole bunch of papers that show that how you pick your friends and which friends you pick have been partially shaped by your genes. And, by natural selection. And very quickly, however, afterwards, I discovered, unsurprisingly, this is the depressing part, that Richard Dawkins had had this similar idea, if not the same idea, like 20 years earlier in a magnificent book called The Extended Phenotype. Now, Richard's work was a, a work of theory, and he said there in his book, he talks, there's no evidence for this. Of course, in my lab, we were trying to adduce such evidence. And, and he was thinking about it in a different way. For example, his prototypic example is a beaver dam. You know, like beaver, yeah. the, 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 the beaver is programmed to make a dam, just like the beaver is, must make a tail of a particular flat, you know, padding tail. And, uh, and the dam is an extended phenotype, and, or what we would call an exophenotype. And, um, and, so, uh, and so, yeah, so, we, so that is the argument. The argument is, is that we, that natural selection has shaped us to do these things outside our body. And the interesting thing about it is once we do those things outside our body, it can create a positive feedback loop with our evolution. Let me give you an example by reference to beavers. So for example, let's say beavers begin to evolve to build dams. And the reason beavers might build a dam is to expand the, the extent of shoreline available to them for foraging. If you dam a creek, you create a larger perimeter that you can now hunt for critters that you might want or more trees that you could take down or, you know, whatever. Incidentally, when you do that, you change the environment for other species like fish. Different kind of fish can now evolve. You've modified, the, you the beaver have modified the environment and you create a selection pressure on fish so that different kinds of fish evolve in environments where there are beavers that are damming creeks than environments where there aren't beavers that are damming creeks. But the interesting part about the beaver is that when the beaver creates the dam, it also creates a selection pressure, not just on the fish, but on itself. In other words, now beavers with bigger lungs that can stay underwater longer can thrive and survive better if they build bigger dams. So over time, the beaver is inducing its own evolution. The lung evolution of the beaver is modified by the dam building behavior of the beaver. Of course, as the lungs of the beaver get bigger, now it can build bigger and bigger dams. So you get this feedback loop between what the beaver is doing outside its body and how the beaver is involving inside its body. Well, I argue it's the same with humans. 
that as we begin to be cooperative or friendly, and we begin to reshape the social world around us, we create friendly worlds. And who thrives in friendly worlds? Friendly people is the argument. Now, of course, sociopaths can also thrive. This is discussed in the book. There are all these wrinkles, et cetera. But the gist of the story is, is we engage in something called niche construction, social niche construction. We create social worlds around us, which create the terrain for us to thrive. For example, you might have evolved, all of us might manifest an evolved tendency to seek out teachers. Why do you seek out teachers? Why do you feel good when you seek out someone who can teach you stuff? Well, those among us who seek out teachers may actually be more fit in a Darwinian sense than those of us who do not. And so you create an environment around yourself that's full of teachers and one thing leads to another and so on. There's a whole other argument we could have about the Ashkenazim, which we're not going to have right now, full other conversations, uh, which might interest you. Uh, you know, the, the written word, if you create an environment in which, in which uh, people, like the, 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 the rabbis were very fecund, but the Catholic priests were not. So if you create an environment mm. in which the ability to, to manipulate the written word is advantaged, you create the circumstances in which, you know, you modify the selection pressure on, on this. So these are, these are other people's ideas, not my work. But anyway, so, so that's some of the arguments about an exophenotype. Now, just to be clear, the written word is not an exophenotype because there's no genes for printing press and no genes for writing. Uh, but I just threw in that example because I thought it might interest you. Mm. There are genes for visual, uh, like our visual acuity, however, which could also be related and reinforced potentially. I, I mean, I'm not a scientist. I don't know why. I threw well, no, I mean, the argument, <laughs> I use that example because that's that's an example from the Latin, next chapter, which is gene culture coevolution, which is a similar but different idea from the exophenotype. When we invent lenses, that's not an exophenotype. We Our technological capacities are not an exophenotype. They, they, that, that falls into the realm of gene culture coevolution. The idea here is because we invent the written word or we invent glasses, uh, you and me, Vanessa, who are myopic, we would have been eaten by lions uh, 10,000 years ago. But now, because of medieval lens grinders and the invention of glasses, we can survive and reproduce and have more myopic children and so over time, human vision might decrease innate, the, number, the genes that give us bad eyesight or contribute to bad eyesight might become more common, the allelic variants, the genetic variants, not strictly the genes. Anyway, the allelic variants. And, uh, and, uh, and so we might all become progressively more myopic because of the invention of, of, of lens, uh, you know, of glasses. Now that's similar to, but different than the exophenotype idea in ways that I discuss in the book. The idea that we, mm. what our cultural inventions could change the course of our evolution. And the most famous example of this is, is uh, the domestication of milk producing animals. So between 3000 and 9,000 years ago, there were multiple times when human beings domesticated milk producing animals, sheep, cattle, camels, cows, and so on, goats. And, um, and so we had a cultural innovation. We domesticated animals. That's a technological, scientific, cultural advance. And when we do that, we modify our environment because now there's milk in our environment. Prior to eight or 9,000 years ago, there was no reason for any adult human to be able to digest milk because once you were weaned, you never saw milk again for the rest of your life. So you have an enzyme in your body called lactase that digests the primary sugar in milk, which is called lactose. And that that lactase enzyme, which you need when you're a baby and you're suckling, actually the wanes and disappears when you're a little child because you don't need it anymore. Be wasteful for your body, unnecessary from an evolutionary perspective for you to still be producing lactase when you're 10 or 20, right? So when you're weaned, three or four, you stop producing lactase. But beginning between three and 8,000 years ago, we now suddenly produce milk. Milk is in our environment. So those among us, who had mutations that allowed for the persistence of lactase into adulthood were more fit in a Darwinian way than those among us who could not eat milk because now we had an extra source of nutrition available to us and an extra source of hydration. You know, if the water was polluted, you would drink the water and die. But if I could drink milk, I would drink milk and survive because the milk is sterile. It doesn't mm -hmm. have the things in it. So 
So this, this has led to the widespread distribution, not the uniform, but the widespread distribution of lactase tolerance, lactase persistence. Uh, and this is work that Sarah Tishkoff and others have done and, uh, and shown that, for example, these lactase G persistence genes emerged in herding populations in Africa, but did not exist in hunter-gatherer populations, which didn't have a, plenty, a ready supply of milk. So this is an example of how culture can change our genes or can contribute to a change. Mm. The same but incidentally goes with the vaccines that we're using right now. So people who otherwise would have died from coronavirus are going to survive because of our vaccines. Medical technology is another example. Uh, so our invention of modern medicine is changing the course of human evolution or, our, or climate change, our warming of the planet through our technology. Mm. The humans that are alive in 5,000 years will be different than the humans that would have been alive had we not warmed our planet. So, so, but these ideas of gene culture coevolution are different than the exophenotype. And the reason they're different is that there aren't any genes for making vaccines or making uh, domesticating animals or doing those things. Whereas there are genes for making friends. And so it's the difference between, it's the difference between, you know, like a snail has to make a shell, its house and carry it with us. It has genes that guide the making of a house. We do not have genes that specify what kind of house we will make or that we but must is it, make a house. Is it possible that some of the things that we assume aren't genetically required actually are, but just haven't had the environment allowing for it? Yes, but that's a very long and difficult topic, which would require tremendous speculation. Uh, but yes. But it is possible in theory. Yes. Presumably, we don't. We never had uh, um, glasses making genes that was just waiting for us to figure out how to grind lenses. But maybe therein lies Spinoza. 